the Primarchs, demigod beings, sons of the Emperor, created from his own genetic material, destined to be generals in the reunification of mankind across the stars. Humanity was on the path to a golden age, where the mysticism and ignorance of all night, the fall of humanity's federation was shed. It was within the fingertips of mankind, the dawn of a new era of peace and advancement, only to be ripped from our grasp by the machinations of thirsting dark gods and their allies. It is the 31st millennium. The Imperium of Mankind has spread across the stars, only for at its zenith it was betrayed by the Emperor's most beloved son, the War Master, Horus Lupercal. The galaxy burns as superhuman to mortal man fight for the future of the species. Enemies, friends, brothers would battle across the stars. Hello brothers and sisters, my name is Hal and today we will dive into the events surrounding the clash between two Primarchs, Rogal Dawn of the Imperial Fists and Alpharius of the Alpha Legion. These events can be found within the book Horus Heresy Praetorian of Dawn, definitely worth a read and can be found on the Black Library website. I hope you are all relaxed as we delve into the clash of brothers. Rogal Dawn, Praetorian of Terror and Primarch of the Imperial Fists, strode towards the chamber door. He knew what was behind it. Compliance had been reached upon this world, but far in advance of the timeline the Imperial Fists had calculated. The World Prince had surrendered to Imperial rule, his entire family slain by planted assassins. One's Dawn himself had not authorized. Another hand had struck the neck of this world, and all around could see Dawn's rage as the truth of these events had become apparent. Arkema stood beside his Primarch as they opened the heavy chamber door. Three legionaries in metallic turquoise plates stared back two standing besides one, sitting upon a throne. All their features were like a mirror of each other, all bearing a face that had no distinct features. Some had ostentation, whilst others possessed the simple plate and iconography of the 20th Legion. Alpharius, Primarch of the Alpha Legion, was here. Immediately Dawn began to scold his brother, daring to play pointless tricks and games even now. Dawn told him he had had enough of Alpharius' lies. Alpharius shook his head telling Dawn he did not keep things from his commanders. That is a lie, said Dawn calmly. Alpharius only smiled back. Do you really wish us to be at cross purposes, brother? We are at cross purposes, Dawn said, holding Alpharius' gaze and honesty is a quality I value, said Dawn, making his point clear. 
that he deemed Alfarius did not hold up this same virtue. You did not declare that you were operating on this world. Not until you had to. Our ways are not the same, replied Alfarius, but you cannot question their effectiveness. You did not have to kill them. Dawn's voice shook the air like a roll of thunder. Arcamus looked at his Primarch, but Dawn's face was as fixed and emotionless as ever. Only in the dark glitter of the eyes did the rage leak out. When he spoke again, his voice was low and controlled, always restrained always holding back, which he deemed unsightly. You did not need to kill them, Dawn whispered. A heartbeat of silence followed the words. Arcamus watched Alpharius and his two warriors. All of them were as unmoving and expressionless as statues. Everyone in the chamber knew what Dawn was referring to. The world they stood on had resisted, initial overtures of compliance, a so-called world prince, and a web of blood ties nobility saw the world as theirs, and theirs alone. Their pride would not let them bow down to any other, no matter how mighty. But the billions living within the planet's hives and the potential contribution those hives could make to the Great Crusade could not be allowed to remain outside the dominion of the Emperor. Mankind could not afford to be splintered again if it was to weather the threat of Xenos and war. In the millennia to come, Dawn himself had taken the task of bringing the world into compliance at the head of his imperial fists. They had been winning, hive by hive, battle by battle. And then the Alpha Legion had arrived. They had announced themselves by taking one of the smaller hives, said to be the focus of the imperial fists next offensive. The hive's leadership surrendered suddenly, following a coup. A signal for Rogel Dawn's personal attention, saying that the hive would fall had been received six hours before it surrendered. The signal had used the Imperial Force's highest level of clearance, and had signed off by saying that Lord Alpharius and the 20th Legion were honoured to be joining the Seventh Legion in bringing the planet to compliance. But as it was, Alpharius and his legion's way, they had hidden within the shadows, even from their own allies. Was this in part to the path of success? The fists, the anvil upon which the twentieth would hammer? or because they deemed their brothers unworthy or unable to stomach their way of war. Alpha Legion forces had been sighted in the weeks that followed. A wing of armor had swept out of the ash wastes to lend their aid to the assault on a primary surface hub of the planet's subterranean tunnel network. Scattered reports had placed warriors in variations of Alpha Legion colors in multiple battle zones. A legion operating in the same sphere, but without the purview. Troubled dawn, but no indication, no attempts, and joint assaults had come. The war had been short, but brutal. Only a core of resistant hives remained, centered around the seat of the World Prince. 
the prideful leader too stubborn to kneel before a superior force on the eve of a renewed assault to take the last hives the world prince had sent the signal of surrender in the course of a single hour all of his direct blood relatives had been slain the assassin in each case had been someone trusted and close to them at the end of that hour the world prince had given his world to the imperium and 401 members of the planet's ruling nobility were dead a total collapse of society had broken down the last bastions of resistance but at what cost was this method truly necessary a question dawn directed at alfarius we did not need to kill them the lord of the 20th spoke that is true we could have waited for you to grind your way through their troops step by tedious step the future cannot be won by a war waged in shadows, Dawn retorted. It will not be won any other way, Alpharius spat back. But Dawn would not be quelled. Then that future will be dead before it can begin. Do not moralize at me, brother, spat Alpharius. And now it was his turn to flick from control to anger. That face, so similar and yet so different from Dawn, finally expressed emotion. Would the deaths of those who you would have killed been acceptable because they died in open battle? If only 400 had to die, to save thousands, would that not be better? Would the thousands of piled bodies, ruined beyond recognition by munitions blasts, and brutal Astartes combat be acceptable? Yes, said Dawn. Alpharius held Dawn's gaze. I think we see the universe very differently, Rogel. No, said Dawn. I do not think we see the same universe at all. The end matters, said Alpharius at last. They were both building the Imperium's golden age to come. To waste time in open warfare was pointless. Would the humanity of the golden era to come even care about how that utopia was built? Victory matters, said Alpharius. Everything else is just delusion. With victory we can build dreams, but without victory they remain just dreams. Dawn replied, and how would you salvage a dream from your victory? Here and now, on this world, we cannot trust the world prince to rule for us. And you have removed those who could have taken his place. Even a defeated people prefer rule by one of their own. You have won this battle but you have done it by seeding the ground with resentment and bitterness. Dawn was right. This world was compliant, but for how long? The manner of imperial victory would never be forgotten by the people. That resentment would only bloom with the absence of the Astartes. How many worlds could the legions conquer if they had to perpetually look 
over their back at those they had already conquered. Some would call what I did gentle, compared to the ways of our brothers, said Alpharius. Kurz, Mortarian, Angron, even the Khan and fetid Horus. Would you call what they would have done preferable? Was the destruction left in the wake of their brothers preferable to this peace? You are certain that you are right, said Alpharius. But if you disdain me, then why not my maker? Why not our father? He created us all. Or do you think my nature accident? Or him, ignorant of what I do for him, what any of us do for him. You think he approves of your methods, Dawn spat. Alpharius replied, he created us all, molded the mysteries in our blood, put us to use as he needs, sees what we do and yet chooses to do nothing. What does that tell you? Dawn, Alpharius, all the Primarchs were to embody an aspect of the Emperor. Did Dawn truly believe there was no part of their father willing to wage war in the shadows? And what did that say about the Emperor? His tacit approval of Alpharius. Was Dawn willing to acknowledge that part of the being he admired so much? He expects us to see our own flaws and overcome them, said Dawn. Yes, said Alpharius. And how are you progressing with yours? Nothing moved in the chamber. Alpharius waited, unmoving, eyes unblinking. You will withdraw your forces from this world, said Dawn. All of them. The agents and operatives too. I know that you use them, and I know how. I will be looking for them. And if I find any, they will not be spared. You will not find any, said Alpharius. Dawn shook his head and began to turn towards the doors. Dawn stopped at the doors and turned back. Your initial strikes were misdirected, he said to Alpharius. You infiltrated one hive and made it fall by systematic destabilizing of authority. But you should have waited. You could have used it as a node from which to disperse your human operatives and agents into the other hives. You managed to do that to a degree, but you could have forced a total collapse in their defenses across the planet, not just surrender by assassination. That move was also mistimed. Another 37 hours, and the pressure from our assault would have been eroding their ability to communicate. Secondary psychological fear, doubt, and confusion would have been rising to a peak. You could have ridden that, played and controlled its pace, forcing the hives to fall or change size at the exact moment when it would amplify whatever effect you wanted. What you did was effective but it was not optimally so by your own 
criteria. Dawn stared at Alpharius, but the Alpha Legion Primarch did not reply. I know you, brother, Dawn continued. I knew that you were here before I walked through the door. I knew it was you on that throne, but not because you made an error in your masquerade. You made no mistake, yet I still knew it was you. Think on that, brother. It is not that I do not understand what you are, or what you do. I understand both. We are what we choose to be. Dawn turned and walked to the doors. Archamus followed. For the Emperor, said Alpharius, as Dawn pushed the chamber doors wide. Dawn paused, then walked out without looking back. A bitter note was sung that day, an unreconcilable difference that kept the two legions from ever enacting compliance together again as the decades of the Great Crusade progressed. It was those words and interaction that played upon the mind of Alpharius. He truly understood that Rogel Dawn's dislike of him was on a fundamental level. In truth, the feeling was mutual. It is hard to like your brother when he's so pompous, yet considers himself a humble servant. His armor is made from the same substance as our fathers, and he has been given command of the Imperial Palace's defenses. No one likes a braggart, but when you go attired for war, in a manner reminiscent of the master of mankind, it behooves one to acknowledge that. Aggressive humility in such circumstances seems almost like its own form of arrogance. Also, he never lies. I do not trust anyone who only speaks the truth. We only openly worked together once in that campaign against the World Prince. After my Legion's intervention, had rapidly speeded the world's capitulation into compliance by guiding the assassinations of almost all their ruling class in one night. Rogel berated me not only for helping him, but for doing so badly in his view. He claimed my legion's efforts had been effective, but not optimally so by my own criteria, and in this he was both correct and misled. It was true that I could have ordered my forces differently. I could have waited until the situation became even less stable for the defenders, and I could have avoided the assassination of the ruling blood, and allowed a less fractious eventual compliance. The fact that I did not, and Rogel recognized this, tells us something. Firstly, it tells us Rogel believed my legion 
should work as directed by the imperial fists, and that my methods, and that my methods should be subservient to his, for a legion and a primarch, so caught up in their devotion to the emperor, and imperium above all else. That is an interesting juxtaposition of supposed humility and unacknowledged arrogance. He and I are brothers, after all, and supposedly equals. I wonder if Rogul would have made the same demands had he been joined in the field by Horus, or whether, since my legion and I were perceived latecomers to the Great Crusade, he viewed that he had superiority by means of seniority. Secondly, it tells us that Rogel was aware of the potential for forcing compliance by means of non-military intervention, as well as his own successes in the field, but made no effort to bring this about himself. He always sees open combat as the only true method. Thirdly, it tells us that if you wish to find out whether your brother knows how you think, you should give him the opportunity to criticize your conduct and see what aspect he focuses on. He might indeed identify true fallings that should be corrected but he will almost certainly highlight his own blind spots and weaknesses as much through what he does not say. Why should I need to know this? Rogel has made the throne world his in a manner no other Primarch has done. He has overseen its defenses and tailored them to his own wishes. Should my father fall for some reason, who else would the Imperium look to for leadership in the immediate aftermath of such a tragedy that the loyal, devoted son who stands in the Imperial Palace behind defenses he has constructed, wearing armor that is, after all, so very reminiscent of our fathers. I do not trust Rogel Dawn. The seeds of distaste would bloom into hatred with the dawn of the Horus heresy. Nine legions have betrayed the Imperium and the Emperor. The galaxy burns as the forces of Horus carve their way towards the Sol system. In the Bastion realm, gutted and transformed by Dawn and his legion, in preparation for the defense of humanity's future, a shadow lurks beneath. Since the news of the Istvan massacres, all knew that every road would lead to terror, and after seven years of waiting for the Imperial Fists, that day had come. It had started with a message, a sabotage of statues in the Primarch's images, leaving only Dawn and Alpharius standing. 
the Praetorian of Terror understood that this wasn't about the war. It was about proving superiority. Did Alpharius and the Twentieth side with Horus and the thirsting gods that fueled them? Or was this about the victory of ideals? That confrontation decades ago had created a question between them both. A war could only be won from the shadows. Alpharius didn't have to siege terror. He simply had to beat dawn. He simply had to prove he was right. Across the soul system, Archamus followed the lead set by his Primarch Dawn. A wild hunt on the heels of a plot put in motion decades before. A master stroke set by the twentieth to cripple the outer defences of terror. It was almost too late, as Archamus uncovered the thread of lies. As in horrifying truth, the Alpha Legion fleet appeared. To the station of Pluto and its moons, the battle began. Just thirty ships, led by Sigismund, faced the sudden attack and were severely outnumbered. The Loyalist fleet let loose Imperial might, but quickly became overrun and scarred. Fire ships, hidden amongst the Alpha Legion fleet, wreathed ships in flame and death. Annihilating hordes of Imperials from the material universe, splitting the fleet into three parts. The twentieth attempted to distract and flank the desperate overwhelmed Imperial defenders. Alpharius himself, already aboard the station, as his elite terminators teleported in around them. Hours of time was bought by the tide of imperial blood, willing to give everything. Great heroes of the seventh, men who had survived the great crusade, fell at the hands of their once allies. Archamus and his brothers were the last defense, as they prepared to face a Primarch. But the time they had all bought was precious, as the moon-sized station, the Phalanx, arrived. Rogal Dawn had arrived. Archamus, impaled by the pale spear, and on the edge of death, looked up as the gleaming, golden Praetorian of Terror entered the battle. A moment cut short as Archamus stared at the spear tip jutting towards him. It was a beautiful strike in all his years of war, over a century and a half. From the cold warrens of Inwit, Archamus had never seen the like. Its simplicity, like a line drawn by a master artisan on a bare parchment, it was death and ruin, and silence without end, and Storm's teeth met the spear's thrust, and reality shrieked, 
a sheet of silver sparks exploded from the point at which the two weapons met. Alpharius and Dawn stood before each other, and it was as though the universe made space for this meeting of brothers. Again, nothing radiated from that indistinct face but fury burned in the eyes of Dawn. I came here for you, Rogun, said Alpharius, as he slid back, spear spinning. Dawn was cutting again and again, and each blow churned the air. This was about victory, Alpharius said, true victory. A Linnaean stepped into Dawn's path. Storm's teeth cut through the torso of the Terminator. Gut fluid and blood gushed out as the dead flesh and armor fell. The Linnaeans and Huskars were a shrinking circle around the two Primarchs. Look at this. Look at what I have done here. This is not a war you can win your way, called Alpharius. Dawn stood before him, and the spear was suddenly still as his brother loomed above him. A sculpture of vengeance cast in gold. Dawn sliced downwards. Alpharius raised the spear. The weapons clashed, and suddenly the Alpha Legion Primarch was spinning close, Storm's teeth arcing past him harmlessly. But you are blind to what you are fighting. We are both fighting for the future, Rogun. If only Rogel had seen what they had seen, the truth revealed by the Cabal. Alpharius lunged. Dawn jerked aside, blink fast. The spear tip caught in his shoulder and punched through the golden armor. Dawn staggered. I did this so that you would understand, shouted Alpharius, so that you would see that you cannot win. I am not here to kill you, brother. I am not here for Horus. I am here to give you victory. Victory was truth. An undeniable fact that exonerated the war of shadows that dealt with the very existence of humanity. All Dawn had to do was lose to witness the folly of his stubborn choice and to open his eyes to what this loss would show him. Dawn was astride in front of Arcamus, blood bright and scattering as he wrenched free of Alpharius's spear. The Huskars fell, their legs cut out beneath them as Alpharius spun wide, spear arcing low like a scythe through long grass. And now Dawn stood alone, blood running down the gold of his armor. I know the enemy, said Alpharius. I know your weaknesses and theirs. I know the truth. Alpharius had seen the enslavement of Horus to these dark gods, the enslavement of Dawn to the rotting human empire 
that fed these dark gods. It would one day destroy sentient life. Dawn stepped forwards, Storm's teeth slamming down, battering into the spear blade. In a blaze of light, Alfaria slipped to the side, and Dawn turned the direction of his cut as it fell. But Alfarius was not where his movement should have taken him. He was behind Dawn's cut, the blade of his spear slicing down. I can give you victory, brother. Alfarius urged him again. Dawn swayed aside, and the spear blade skimmed his chest. Slivers of gold and silver feathers fell to the deck, and Alfarius was overextended, and Dawn was turning, his strength flowing into a wide lateral cut that would never land. It would never land, because in that instant, Arcamus saw what was about to happen. Alfarius was not overextended. He was exactly where he needed to be, to turn past Dawn's blow and make another, last, perfect thrust with his spear. Archimus felt his blood-drained body try to move faster, try to push itself across the few meters separating him from the Lord, whose life and service were the reason he did not fear. Dawn cut, Storm's teeth blurred, Alfarius swayed back, pivoting and sliding a hair's breadth past the screaming edge. Archaemus lunged to his lord's side, his seax blade reaching for the spear thrust, even as it unfolded. His blade caught the haft of Alfarius' spear, and the force of the connection kicked through the metal arm like the kiss of a lightning bolt. Archaemus reeled back, staggering to the deck, and the spear struck home. It rammed through Dawn's armor and into the flesh, and stopped. Dawn stood, unmoved, the spear embedded in his shoulder, where he had stepped in to take the blow. His left hand was locked around the spear's haft. For an instant, the two Primarchs were at an arm's reach apart, eye to eye. Brother, Alpharius began. It was the moment of triumph, the cutting down of a wounded animal too stubborn to accept its weakness. Dawn had Storm's teeth through Alvarez's arms above the wrists. Blood and sparks fell in the flash of gunfire. The world became a slow sliding tableau of movement. Dawn's face, cold stone, marked with blood and strobing shadows as he pulled the spear from his shoulder. Alfarius, staggering, lashing out with a kick, another cut, scything from left to right. Storm's teeth 
ripping armor like parchment, red gloss sheen on indigo blue, and a demigod falling, his torso an open cave of meat and bone, the only sound the growl of storm's teeth and the clang as Alpharius struck the deck and began to rise, strength defying the red ruin of his body, Dawn still had the spear in one hand, but victory, Alpharius gasped, this was meant to be the triumph of truth, the superiority of the shadowed wall, everything Alpharius was, his values carried at the point of a shadowed spear had been endured and conquered. Dawn rammed the spear through his brother's chest, the tip punched through the power plant on the back of Alpharius's armor. Alpharius's mouth opened, his eyes wide, a great wash of blood poured from between his teeth. Dawn held him on the spear, the two were so close that it seemed almost like an embrace. The air around them was blurring like a heat haze as the blood struck the floor. A high wail was rising with a coil of wind which circled the pair. Alpharius's mouth moved, forming words. Dawn was still for a second, his eyes blank and black in the carved stone of his face. He had killed a brother. How many of them were capable of such a crime against nature? Then he pushed Alpharius away. Snakes of light writhed through the air. The Primarch of the Alpha Legion staggered mouth still moving, Rogal Dawn brought Storm's teeth around, the blade cut down through Alpharis's skull and then tore free in a spray of blood and a detonation of light. If a war was waged within shadow, then the future it created was already dead. Dawn didn't care about truth, about demonstrating superiority, about whose answer was more justified than the others. Alpharius was simply a brother who had betrayed them. The last planet of the solar system turned in silence. Explosions flashed, ships glittered like snow falling through a winter night, lives ended. They ended in small places, but the air sucked away in the roar of gunfire pouring through passages, in the spinning blackness with a last sight given to them was the blink of explosions and the light of stars, and they ended in the heart of a moon, with the blood of a being who had been more than a human, but less than a god, pooling on a floor of cold iron. Rogal Dawn, Praetorian of Terror, looked down at the corpse of his brother. Around him, the world turned. Groups of warriors appeared in fresh flashes 
or teleportation light. They spread through the vault as the doors crashed open and Kestros ran in and saw a sight that none would have believed. A moment that should have stopped the galaxy on its axis. A Primarch dead at the hands of his brother within sight of the world of their creation but the soul system turned without pause unknowing or uncaring if the 20th had felt the death of their gene sire they gave no indication no mourning only death leaving with the prize they had sought all along the schematics of the soul system's defenses. The battle may have been lost, but the war was far from over. The question between the legions unanswered, only waiting for more blood to be spilled. Omegon woke, he had never slept never dreamed or felt the tug of mortal fatigue in all the days of his existence yet here he was waking from black oblivion the cold deck of the ship beneath him the darkness of his arming chamber closed about him the pulse of beta engines was a distant rumble on the edge of silence. Coldness poured through his flesh, moisture beaded his skin. He could taste blood in his mouth, thick and harsh with iron. His hands were numb, the fingers hooked, as though grasping something that had vanished. It had been a connection he felt in the stars since those early days upon terror. That sensation of being incomplete, a half of a greater whole. He moved the fingers and then brought them up to his face. Sharp needles of pain prickled beneath his touch and then a new feeling came, crushing in its weight, undeniable in its truth, though he could not tell how it had arrived. He was alone. Omegon armoured himself. The blind servitors bolted in the plates of his armour, over his flesh as the numbness in his hands and neck became a smouldering pain. I am alone. The knowledge rose through the coldness of his thoughts, certain and inescapable, though he could not say how he knew that it was fact not fear, was he even capable of that? No news had come from the soul system, but there was a truth he could feel within his soul. His brother was dead. He walked from his armory, the scaled and crested helm of the Primarch of the Alpha Legion under his arm. Arcos was waiting in the sealed chamber where they kept the Metatron. Omegon nodded and the attendants began to unbolt the mask from the one-time Astropath's head. He watched as the famine-thin figure writhed, ghost light and smoke pouring from its mouth to form a shadow in the air. 
above it, a shadow with a face and form. Frost spread across the floor and his armor. He bowed his head, even as the shadow turned to look at him. What had happened? What was happening? What was he now? And he realized that the words he was about to say would trap him for the rest of existence. The jest turned into mocking truth. The mantle once inhabited by two could never be discarded. I am Alpharius. What is your will, my war master? Thank you.